It's a real pleasure to be here with you this afternoon because I think this is a really important topic. And I, I was particularly delighted to be asked because actually I'm still a practicing neurologist. I work up at the, the Royal Free Hospital in, in North London. And um, one of the reasons that I started to change in terms of what I did in my job was that I found it inordinately frustrating that you wanted to do the right thing, but you were only ever able to do it one patient at a time. And even if you were doing the right thing, you couldn't spread the mechanisms and the learning from that. Uh, and it seemed to me that there had to be different ways of doing things to, to allow us to identify the best solutions and to get them out to as many people as possible. So that, that equitability that we've heard about uh, uh, already. Um, and I think the opportunity through um, some of the academic health systems uh, might help take that forward. And myself and Ben, who's following later, uh, run two of those systems. ECL Partners covers a, a geography of six million in London and into Essex, and, and Ben works in the, the Manchester uh, system. What I'm going to do is not talk very specifically about multiple sclerosis, and I the reason for that is, is twofold. One, I wouldn't regard myself as a, an MS specialist. I'm a fairly general neurologist. But I think often there is a lot of learning that, ha that should be taken from other areas. And there is, there is an unfortunate tendency, particularly in medicine, for us to get into silos and think that that's the only solutions that we can look at. And I think you know, a lot of people are looking at how about the uh, plus and negative side of variation uh, and what can be done around that. And I think there's a lot of learning that we can take from others. Um, I, and uh, I, I also think that um, it's important that we try to spread our network of working so that we're working with uh, a far greater group of, of people. So as much as there, there's a degree of diversity in this room, uh, we need to broaden that out. And of course, you can't always do that physically in, uh, in lecture theatres. So how do we get that communication message? Uh, there are narratives to be created here, which is more than how we do it through, um, uh, through, through, through media. But how do we communicate amongst ourselves? So I, I'm going to look at, if you like, sort of defining some of the issues and, and the problems uh, before we start to think about the solutions. And, and I think it is important because th th there has been what I'd regard as quite an obsession with the reduction of uh, variation agenda, which clearly in some senses where we want to uh, uh, improve uh, access and equitability is, is important. But I don't think variation is, is either always good or, or always bad. It's important you know when variation is appropriate and not. Uh, and when we have variation that is essentially built on us not actually having any evidence uh, or based on, on or anecdotes or, or how people uh, practice clin uh, clinically, uh, or if there's a very limited evidence base, uh, or it's based on the ignorance both of the uh, profession or of patients, then one could regard that as, as not being ideal. But where we want to get to, I, I would argue, is that we want people to have the best choice based on the best current evidence and having the best access to what's available. Uh, and that will create variation, which is perfectly uh, legitimate. Uh, and increasing personal choice, I think, is, is, is the ideal outcome here. So the, this slide, in one sense, shows an, uh, a, an example of variation. And when I first saw this slide, there was a, a caption at the top that said, um, never become the person that lives in the house on the left-hand side. And you, know, you can sort of look about how there are people who have uh, access to certain things or different outcomes. But actually, the context, the setting of all these things is fundamentally important. You know, unless you know the context of something, you don't really know whether the difference here is, is, is good or bad. And, and I think that context setting and understanding the need uh, which comes back to the issue about re uh, revolving this around the, the patient and the populations that we're trying to treat is, is, is really important. There has been some, I, I think, really, really important work setting out the principle about how essentially data can be a very good place to start in terms of identifying where the, the, there is significant variation and what you want to do about that. That might be actually trying to understand that variation a bit more, uh, or it may be trying to, to act on it. And one of the areas that I got involved in, uh, because I ended up uh, setting up a, a stroke service in, in North London, and then looking at how we can prevent stroke and treating this condition called atrial fibrillation. 
uh, the, the, there's been great work through the, 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 the Right Care movement, which was set up by uh, Muir Gray, a, a public health specialist, which created these regional maps based on data uh, around variation. And you know, that, that's been a really great catalyst and driver for some of the thinking that has then allowed us to look at some of the solutions that we can, uh, we can act on. Uh, so having data that are then allows you to do something about it or deciding you don't is clearly not a bad position to be, be starting from. And I think it is good that when we recognise that, that there is uh, bad or unwarranted variation, which could be across regions or localities or, uh, or countries, to have some insight into the reasons why that, that happens. Uh, and the sad truth in, in medicine, despite our best intentions, you know, we, o we over often diagnose, we, over, uh, we often over treat, uh, and actually that contributes quite significant uh, harm and sometimes uh, variation uh, and can add to sort of inequalities in the, in the health system. It generates waste. And I think as health professionals, there is an increasing duty for us to be responsible for uh, what happens in terms of spending of the public purse. Uh, and I think as, as health professionals, we've probably not been quite as, uh, as up to speed uh, as that as, as we should. I, I fundamentally believe that listening to the, the patients that, that, uh, that, that you're treating is often the thing that should be then driving the, the right thing to do. Uh, and that can be evidence-based. Uh, and this is a, an example taken from uh, Tom Lee, who actually was one of my mentors who helped set up Harvard Health Partners, which linked the Boston universities with their local health system. And when you, when you talk to patients, you really get an insight into what it is that they think is important that will make a difference. And actually spending that quality time with their health professionals is often the thing that they, that they want more. They're not actually asking for the latest technology, the latest drug. They want information from people that they, that they, can, that they can trust. So this is, this is a quote which I think has come from, from Muir Gray, which really tries to, to, to recenter the, um, the, the, the emphasis on, uh, on how important it is about what the patients, patients actually, uh, actually want and, and what matters to, to them. And I think that's really interesting because, as Gavin said, you know, there is quite a lot of information that's been around now. Michael Marmot's stuff uh, dates back to uh, the 1990s about the broader determinants of health, the things that actually make you unwell, which often have absolutely nothing to do with medical care as such. Uh, which probably, and I think in my next slide, it, it breaks that down into to what the determinants are. But we, we have actually created a, a biomedical model which focuses much of our resource, uh, our staff, uh, uh, and what we put into it uh, around medical care, and specifically acute medical care. And although there's a very good argument for that being resourced and it, and it provides great service and great need, there are other things that then do not become resourced because of this, um, uh, of this tension. And th this uh, piece has come out from Nesta quite recently, which I think looks at this uh, in, in, I think, actually quite a balanced way. So um, I, would, I would recommend it. This, uh, it doesn't uh, show up very well, but in essence, this is the sort of slide that um, follows on from Michael Mar Marmot's principles about you know, what the, determin the broader determinants of health are. Uh, and, you know, some of those things we do not address very well um, around uh, individual behaviours, uh, the sort of things that lead to uh, people's educational status, where they live, their social group. We tend not to address that as part of the solutions that we can find that can make a difference. We, we, we tend not to incentivise these things. We, we don't collect the data that then allows you to see what those problems are and what we need to do about them. And this was, a, a, I think, a very useful piece from the Health Foundation, building on this, uh, this recognition that there are many things that we need to do, but are we actually linking the data from different sets that allows to then look at variation uh, in, in, in a much more bro uh, broader context, which I think we need to, to be doing? That, that doesn't mean that, for example, pharmacological solutions don't have a place to play, but there are so many other things that are important to patients. Patients tell us that all, all the time. So we're not thinking about it, we're not collecting the data about it, we're not investing in it. This is just one example. 
We're not actually training people in areas that are clearly uh, important, and that then has a knock-on effect uh, for what uh, resources can be available to patients. Uh, it's really unequivocal about this, uh, about this skew, and I, I think as a group we have to come together. And for me, there's an important story to be to, to be created here. So I, I alluded in one of the earlier slides about linking data. I think data is not always the answer, but it's a good place to to start. Uh, but we have problems with data and the use of data, and I don't think that we can shirk away from those. And you know, one of the the significant challenges is that there have been examples, uh, even quite currently, where there has been an abuse of data from patients, where we don't have a dialogue with them about what we're using it for uh, and what secondary purposes that data is used for. Uh, and I think we have to try and really overcome that and have a framework and an assurance and a mechanism by which we can uh, we can share data. And there, there has have been a number of uh, uh, studies that have shown that although we're starting in generally from a good place so uh, we're trusted a lot more than journalists for example but you know that's 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 all relative uh, so people would say that they trust their doctors uh, their gps but we have created examples where we have clearly abused that trust uh, and if we lose that trust then it's going to be very very difficult for us to make the health changes that, that we all feel are uh, are necessary I think the, the other piece that uh, is very difficult is that identifying the variation that you want to, to address uh, is important. But one of the difficulties, and, and Ben and I know this uh, working within academic health science networks, is that the health system is inordinately complicated. It, even people like us who have spent decades within health systems probably do not understand it. This slide from the King's Fund was actually quite a good attempt to do it, but you know the, the tragedy is that within a week or two of this coming out, it was already out of date. You know, how, how do you explain to people, to patients or to people who want to help, how to navigate a system that is, that is, uh, is so complicated? I talked earlier about the linking of data, and I think that is a, a, a fundamental issue, and I, I hope as part of this session, uh, we start to, uh, uh, and tomorrow, we start to think about, you know, what are the sort of data sets that we need to capture? Where are the gaps? And how do we start to link them in a way that's, uh, a way that's important? But I think one of the things that's, that's, that's equally important is we have to be asking the right questions at the, at, at, at the right time. So if you look at this slide, it's a sort of missing cat. Uh, and then if you look at this one, it shows that, you know, the cat, cat's actually been found. So it, it sort of gives an example that we need to be looking at the right time and asking the right question. And we're often not using real world data uh, in a way that would then help answer the right question at the right time. Uh, and it may be that Ben might talk a little bit uh, uh, about that around uh, uh, about the creation of evidence. <coughs> I think another big challenge, which as we come on to what we do around variation and how we act on it, is that I think there are significant uh, gaps in the expertise that we need to actually address the problems. Uh, and we are not always the answer for these people. We, we don't often and, uh, and often aren't trained in uh, the specific forms of expertise that need us to challenge what are highly complex problems. I think quite a good place to start uh, is, is having uh, a fairly simple vision about what, about what it is that we're trying to do. And I think this Institute of Health uh, work, which has been uh, advocated by people like Don Berwick and others, uh, I think is, is, is really difficult to disagree with. It has to be predicated on what patients are experiencing. We do want to focus on quality, uh, but we do have a responsibility to take the, the financial imperative and the fact that we're working within constrained budgets and, and where that money goes. And if you're going to spend uh, a huge part of the budget on a, a certain innovation or intervention, what's happening to the rest doesn't suddenly just be uh, get created from anywhere else. Uh, we, we did work with Michael Porter and Tom Lee uh, about five or six years ago. and. Muir Gray has uh, also done some work in this area, which is looking at this value proposition. Uh, and Gavin, I think, talked about the importance of focus on outcomes. And I, I would completely, uh, I 
completely agree with that. Uh, this is a slide taken from the Commonwealth Health Fund, which looks at various uh, aspects of uh, care provision. And actually, on many things, on many metrics, the United Kingdom performs very, very well. We're often held up as a beacon uh, for health systems across the world, and in, and in many, many uh, areas we are. But the area at the bottom where we actually perform really bad is, on, is in the one that I would argue is the most important, health care outcomes. We, we do not perform well as a, a system. Uh, and I think it's really, really important that, you know, that we think collectively and collaboratively about uh, the outcomes that we're trying to create. We become very, very obsessed around metrics of process uh, and processes which can be important and can be drivers for change uh, are not outcomes. So let's start concentrating on the outcomes that we, we want to collect. Uh, and that can be, be quite uh, complicated because there are many sources that you want to collect it from. It's a challenge, but it's also a great opportunity. And of course, now with a move to trying to, to put patients at the centre of the healthcare, there is the potential to, ask, to access other forms of data which can allow us to measure patient reported outcomes and other outcomes much more effectively uh, and uh, authentically. This is an example taken from uh, a focus on cardiovascular disease. And they, I think, are a bit more advanced in their thinking about you know, what, what areas do you want to measure and what are the outcomes that you want to, uh, to, to focus on. The other thing that I think there is potential for is trying to create uh, international groups that are uh, reaching consensus about outcomes. These problems are, are, are seldom the problems of individual countries. Uh, they're international problems, and MS leads the way in the international networks that you created. But what I don't know is, you know, do you have metrics of internationally agreed outcomes? Michael Porter uh, and uh, his group initially set up this international consortium for health outcome measures, uh, and there has been some uh, work done uh, uh, within neurology settings. Uh, this is the, uh, one of the settings for uh, one of the uh, outcome measures for Parkinson's disease. And what I think is really good about this is it's not focused just specifically on a medical model about you know, who gets what treatment. These are things that have been done around what are important to patients. Uh, and I was involved in the stroke uh, outcome group, which again worked across about 10 countries and came up with this uh, group of outcomes which were very much centred around what was important to, to patients. Engagement with patients and, and how we have that dialogue and the new ways of doing that, I think, are really, really important. Um, and there, I think there are multiple ways and there, there are learning that we can do from other groups. This is a piece of work that we have supported around creating digital platforms that allow uh, patients with dementia to have access to the most appropriate trials. Uh, and now this has become uh, essentially one of the main ways that patients uh, can have access to, to numerous studies across the, the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, the work that Gavin has done around how you create dialogue uh, with a community around multiple sclerosis, I think, has been very, very inspirational and starts to allow us to think really creatively about that engagement uh, and, uh, and how people start to feel valued and really contributing to something and therefore want to be much more involved. Uh, and we're also working with a, 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 an SME called Health Unlocked that have set up uh, online communities for many, many different uh, disease, non-disease, health-related uh, areas and, and have a lot of impact uh, nationally and, and, and internationally. And they have a, an MS community, which is at least one example about how you get people from different parts of the country starting to communicate and share knowledge. And actually what this company does is it can then start to drive down into individual regions. So you could actually take this community and say, so for Gavin's population within East London, you know, what treatments are you getting? And then starting to get a bit, a, a bit more impact into, uh, into equitability. And, and they've started to use it around this, this issue about patient activation. How do you make patients much more in charge of their own health care? because part of the solution has to be patients taking, taking much more responsibility and, and control of their own health. The, th this talk and this workshop isn't uh, an, enough time to start thinking about some of the solutions, but I think we do have to start thinking about the challenges about 
how we then start to affect change. And you know, I'm really quite interested about behaviour change, both in professional bodies and in patients themselves. And those of you in London who have been in London recently probably have seen this this tube advert around how you can use what what is terms of behavioural economics, where you can incentivise patients to start improving their health care by giving them some incentives. With this one, where they get you know a, a, a cheap uh, a, a a cheap smart watch. So, who are who are the influencers? Who are the people that you want to work with to make it to make a difference? And there are different ways of looking at this. And we have sort of moved where it really was around how we worked uh, in market economies to control and and fiefdoms. And although they of course still operate. It seems quite clear that the organisations that seem to be having much more influence are our networks, because I think they, they do allow a, dem a democratisation of, of power and knowledge and, and do allow things to, to move forward. And the academic health science networks that Ben and I uh, are involved with uh, is at least one mechanism of doing that. Uh, we do a lot of work in, in terms of how we identify and try and reduce variation, but we also look at how we can use innovation as being the answer to address uh, unwanted uh, variation uh, across England. And so we have 15 academic health science networks who communicate and work uh, collectively as a team. That doesn't mean that they're all doing the same thing, but what it does mean is that areas such as this where one or two HSNs have an interest, can act as that single portal so that we can communicate with you irrespective of where you're working across the country. And you know, we've managed to, I think, in the first five years of our creation, have quite a significant impact uh, across many different areas and for many different uh, populations, uh, and also showing significant job creation and return of investment to, uh, to the NHS. And, what we're trying to do is to, to shift this innovation distribution curve. It is always going to be difficult to deal with people who have a sort of specific view of the world about what they want to do. But actually, with uh, organisations that can create learning uh, and show how things can be done and show examples of success and give you the tools to try and make those changes, you can shift that, uh, that curve to the, the left. So one of the ways that we've been doing this uh, is through the creation of a, an innovation accelerator, which is run through all 15 HSNs uh, and has strong support from uh, NHS England. And we've used that to identify proven innovation, which can make a difference to patients, and then use mechanisms to get that out across the, HSS, uh, the, the NHS as quickly as, as possible. Uh, and Actually, that's been very, very powerful, both in making it available to lots of, of, of people, but al also creating a, a repository of knowledge about how do you start to get that innovation into healthcare uh, as effectively as possible, because as uh, what I've talked about earlier, it, it is not easy. There are barriers, but those barriers can be, can be overcome. And these are just a few examples across uh, some of the innovations that uh, we uh, that, that that we support, uh, we don't always just look at innovations that have come from health professionals who have a great idea and who understand the problems. Sometimes it's about the variation and inefficiencies of the NHS itself. And you know, anyone who works in a in an acute NHS setting recognises the huge amount of waste that we have around our outpatient services. And actually, digital technology, if you have trust in organisations that are uh, prepared to embrace solutions, can actually start to make things both better for patients, because it gives them choice, but also you can demonstrate the amount of savings that you can make that can then be reinvested into better, uh, better healthcare. Similarly, you can start to use real-world data. So although it's called Nerve Centre, this tends to use data in real-time in situations. Uh, and this, this SME have started to use data which can start to uh, uh, signal patients within acute settings uh, who, are at, uh, who are at risk of uh, sepsis and identify that to clinicians uh, re really early on. So that actually what you're doing is you're using innovation and technology and real world evidence 
to, to, to save lives. Uh, and actually, I know from some of the work that we've been involved in and Gavin and others, uh, sepsis in, in MS patients is one of the biggest reasons that patients with MS uh, end up uh, going into hospital and often ha having significant complications. So there are mechanisms and things we could learn from others that could allow us to address what is a very significant problem among the MS community. So the, the Academic Health Science Network have been commissioned uh, also to see how we can start to fast track really proven innovation and get it into healthcare as, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and Gavin uh, uh, alluded to some of the work that we've started to, uh, to do recently. And I, I think this slide that Gavin showed uh, is, I think, a really great opportunity. The reason that we were able to work with the Office of Life Science in NHS England uh, and to persuade them that this, that this drug should be given uh, to, m to many more patients is that there was a clear evidence base about the benefit and there was a clear evidence base about patient experience uh, and a clear evidence base about how much it could be saved if it was uh, adopted uh, at scale. So that's the principle, but that's a very long way from actually getting to a situation where every patient who could benefit from that uh, is going to do it. And I guess this is a call to arms from me for people here who want to be part of a greater movement where we can come together and use this as a paradigm to say, so now we've got this green light from government, how do we then use that to come together to demonstrate that we can do something that's better and then use that as a touch paper to start doing more things together? Because what I'd like to think that over the last 25 minutes or so is that, yes, there are problems, but also there are solutions. And I really would like to work with people in this room uh, through academic health science networks and the MS community to, to try and tackle those. Thank you very much. So the, so the question that one of the things is when you see a presentation like this, you see all these tech solutions, etc. And I think there are some potential technology solutions in the MS space. Um, but the, the problem we tend to have is that, is how do you get them um, adopted or, or, or tested at scale? That's one of the issues we have. Yeah, so um, trying to get ad adoption at scale is, 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 is in some ways, the ultimate challenge, and, and the NHS is not good at that. So what, what we've been traditionally good at is invention, discovery science. Uh, we're actually very bad at then, uh, we're actually not bad at creating some evidence base around traditional models of rand uh, randomized control trials. Where I think organize, uh, organizations like academic health science networks are quite good is that we have, over five years, developed huge expertise about how we can take some of those solutions where appropriate. Uh, and then start to, to scale them because we know how we can uh, uh, work with central government around uh, commissioning. Uh, we know how we can work within organisations and then spread those to others. And, and we've also been quite good at how we create that evidence base that overcomes those sort of arguments. Um, because actually it's not about, uh, and, and I think you know, the medical model has almost set the standard about randomised controlled trials, which for some things is useful. Actually, what we're seeing, and it'd be interesting to have Ben's perspective about this, actually having that real-world evidence pool about what happens in real populations when they're using something which we're collecting and which actually Manchester are probably leading the way is going to be a, a, a significant part of the evidence base for the future. And we have examples that we can share around that. I see. So maybe one of this... Uh, Shomali? I think, I think that's a, a, a really important point. Uh, and I think the answer to, to that comes down to the collaborations and network that you can set up that provide the solutions for that. So an initiative that's been set up quite recently through NHS England and NHS Digital is the creation of uh, regional hubs that essentially will share data across 
primary, secondary, community uh, and social care. Uh, and you can set up uh, a, a governance framework that means that the right people have access to that data to answer those questions. So, in fact, there, there now has, uh, has been about five of these hubs created, one in Manchester, one in London. Uh, and we're creating uh, case studies around how we can demonstrate the, the data flows around uh, particular uh, problems. So I'm, I'm not aware that, and it, Ben might be doing it in some uh, areas of neurology, we've started to do it in, uh, in stroke and stroke prevention and end of life care. But I think what that will do will create a, a principle, a way of practice that we can then start to share with others so that clinicians and researchers and uh, charities can come together to say these are the questions that we want the data to answer and you'll have a mechanism to, to, to access that data from. So I think actually right now there's potentially a solution for that that there wasn't even tw uh, 12 to 24 months ago. So, so please hold these thoughts because when we come up with uh, some, some ideas tomorrow particularly we can work on them. Okay, any other questions for Charlie? Thank you very much for coming, Charlie. <laughs> mm.